a few of them will be presenting. So we're really excited. I'm excited for this also. Thank yeah, you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you all. Okay, so our tech talk is, as I said, on CADing and 3D printing, uh, which are two parts of FTC that we use all the time during our mechanical and building process. Um, so this is just the basic overview of what we'll be going over. We'll start with CADing, some stuff that you can do with it, things that we keep in mind and see and seeing, and then uh, we'll move on to 3D printing and just all the stuff that we use it for. Okay, so what is CAD? CAD is computer aid design, and it's using the computers to create and modify and analyze. Um, on the bottom, you can see kind of what it would look like when we're making a CAD. So we start off with our basic drivetrain, uh, which would be the yellow and green aspects on the bottom left picture. Then we move on to adding more functions um, with specific um, gadgets and things like an intake or an outtake. And then at the very end, we have our final product. Um, so 3D printing, or sorry, CAD is very important uh, because it helps us plan our entire build in advance and it helps us choose specific parts. So as you can see, each of these are actually very specific parts that are manufactured. And so that becomes very helpful later when we're actually trying to put the robot together. And then of course, it's also good just to see what the final product will be like. We can actually render it like that final picture. Um, and so overall, it's really just a useful analytic tool and it's good for planning. Uh, so CAD is important to us um, mainly because our team, although we've used it every single year, this is the first year, we have no one that's experienced in CAD. So CAD has really been a learning experience for us. Um, so we actually started off the year by just building simple things. And CAD is great because it's not limited in terms of what it can build and create. So the bottle on the right is actually something that Cindy made over the summer. Um, and the box in the middle is something that Jishnu made. And they were all forms of practice to us so that we could learn about CAD and how versatile it is. Um, CAD is also a collaborative thing, and so that helps us balance off of each other and learn from each other. So on the left is actually our outtake for this year. Um, and that silver kind of clear part was made by Jishnu and the red thing attached to the servo that was made by Michael. And those two parts were then put together and then put on our CAD for this year's robot. And so that's an example of how we can use CAD to come together to create a design, bounce ideas off of each other, and come up with many different variations of the same thing, all working together. Um, so we use CAD libraries, um, which are lists provided by manufacturers such as GoBuilda or Rev of all their manufactured parts to scale. So we have the ability to download these libraries and then put them into our build to use to create. So as you can see on the left, we actually have all of those are parts that we pulled from a library. Um, so the parts are very helpful because they're all organized. Uh, so as you can see on the picture on the right, uh, that's what you might see if you were looking under the electronics section of the Go Build a CAD library. So not only are these very important for the parts order because um, it tells us what we need to order from each manufacturer with the number and the name and everything, but it's actually really important when it comes to how the bot may work. So for example, on the bottom, you can see these bevel gears in the picture and they're attached to a motor and then a rod. Hypothetically, this is a great idea. Yay, we have a working intake. However, if you actually look closer, you can see that the bevel gear is coming in contact with this little connector at the bottom. That would mean that it doesn't work. And so having these scaled um, CADs really helps us determine if our build is viable, what changes need to be made, and if all the parts would actually properly function in their form. Uh, okay, so this is what Fusion 360 looks like. Um, it's the software that we use for our CADing. In the top left corner, you can see it says design. So that's actually a workplace and there's several in Fusion 360. So the first one is design, obviously, and it's used to create mechanical designs and solid bodies. So that would mean our robot, the mechanical body, or the solid bodies would be our 3D prints. 
Um, so the way that that would work is on the top, you can see where it's a solid surface mesh and it has all of those objects. Those would be where we create our three prints. And then of course our mechanical bodies could be pulled uh, from the side where all of our uh, libraries are. And you can actually see all of our parts under browser on the left-hand side. For example, you can see where it says drivetrain version five. If you were to open that up, you could see all the parts that are used in this current CAD all organized in whichever system that we'd like. Um, the next workplace is generative design. That's usually used by manufacturers and not by us, but it allows you to create multiple variations of the same build just with changes to maybe slight changes to the design or the material. And it's used to optimize um, a CAD or creation for manufacturing, performance, or cost requirements. Uh, so again, that, that's really more of an industry thing, but it's good to keep in mind. Uh, after that, there's render, which would be used to create realistic depictions. Um, while we don't technically need that for our season, it's good to show in pictures, and um, it's good to show in pictures and in workbooks. So, for example, this is unrendered, but the image we showed you earlier was rendered, and so it's just a nice depiction of our robot. After that is animation. Um, honestly, I don't think we've ever used animation before, but animation is helpful when you have a moving part because it allows you to see how it would function. And then simulation is, in my opinion, the most interesting. It allows you to put your CAD under certain conditions such as stress to see how it would function. And then on the right hand side, you can actually see the collaborative aspect of CADing as well. So these are all folders that have the CADs of individuals on my team, including myself. And so we can pull ideas from each of these folders and put them together. Our final design would be put in the competition bot folder. And then from that, we can actually pull the competition bot into all the other folders and work on them again. So it's really helpful in that fashion. Sophie, did you want me to give you comments at the end or in between? I didn't, oh, that's that works best for you. Okay, I'm just gonna let you continue. You're doing a great job. I just okay. don't want you to think I wasn't here. So this is an example of CNC. Um, so CNC is computer numerical, numerical controls. It's used for larger custom parts, such as side plates. As you can see in our Fight Frenzy bot, we use like the, the side plates are made from wood that we see in seed. It's used for a variety of materials, um, yeah, such as wood and HDPE. It uses drills called flutes. Uh, things to keep in mind are using clips to prevent movement or bending of the material and pocketing. Um, so um, back to the friend, um, Fight Frenzy bot, the side plates, thanks to CNC customization, make it more compact in the game. Um, so it, like, cause it required maneuvering through a um, small, 13 inch gap. Um, th things to keep in mind. Yeah. The bullet boy about the clips correlates with the bottom picture since you can see the little clips in the corner. Pocketing also relates to that bottom picture. Pocketing is removing pieces of material out of a large piece of material and is usually seen in side plates, as you can see in the bottom picture. Um, some shapes are being carved out. We usually um, use full holes since our plastic side plates are thinner than wood plates and pocketing is important to dec decrease the weight, but should be done carefully as to avoid causing weakness, bending, or instability. All right, yeah, and then uh, as I said, to use the CNC, we use flutes. Uh, so this is an example of what the flutes would look like from the bottom view. Uh, so flutes are actually really similar to drill bits. Um, they just have a fancy name. Honestly, I have no idea why. I'd usually just call them drill bits, but whatever. Um, the blue part on the image, that's what's generally called um, the section area, which includes the main circular base and then as the teeth as well. And then you can see the radius and the circle around it, which increases a little bit per flute. And the red circle, which is actually really important, it's called the chip space. Sorry, the chip space. So on a two flute, um, two flutes are typically used on softer materials like aluminum, and this is because they're less rigid due to the spacing of their teeth, which means that um, they are more likely to break. Um, 
The benefits of having two flutes are that they have more chip space, so you can see that red circle is a bit bigger. So what chip space is, is when you're cutting against the material, um, obviously little like shards or chips or pieces are going to be coming off whatever you're cutting. And so if they get stuck, then that could cause major issues and even break the flute. So the goal of the chip space is to actually allow the chips to fly off of the build to the corners of the CNC machine. Um, and so having a larger space makes it more likely that the chip will be able to get out of the way. Uh, three flutes are actually pretty similar to two flutes. They're really a transitional flute, if you will, between two and four. Uh, they do have a bigger section area, uh, but their chip space is surprisingly pretty similar to that of two flutes. Uh, the main advantages of a three flute would be the higher rigidity, so less likely to break. And then surface finish, which is really the main appeal of having four flutes. So as you can see with the four flutes, it has this highest um, rigidity, it has the biggest section area, and as a result, the smallest chip area, which makes it um, unpreferable when it comes to cutting large things like side plates because it's more likely to run into issues with those larger cuts. Um, however, it's really, really good for surface finish. So it's usually used for profiling, um, which would be like small details, side milling, which would be removing extra material off of the side of a cut, and then shallow slotting, which is making small indents that don't necessarily go all the way through, but need to have a pretty smooth uh, finish to them. And so choosing your type of flute and a accordance to what material you're using, and also what sort of cut you're looking for, is really important to make sure that you have not only a good cut, but you're not breaking any of your flutes. So this is just the uses of 3D printing. We've got production of known parts. We've got the creation of custom parts. We've got customizable design, lighter weight, rapid prototyping, um, and aesthetic. All right, so as said, the very first advantage to 3D printing is production of known parts. Um, obviously, we buy most of our parts from manufacturers. And that can be annoying or an issue when it comes to um, shipping time. So I think last year we actually had a huge disaster where all the parts were backlogged and we didn't have parts coming in for over a month, which as you can imagine, set things back by a long time. So that's a huge issue. Some of that can be resolved by 3D printing our own parts. Uh, so some manufacturers will give us instructions on how to print our parts. So to the left, you can actually see on the top of pulley which is where we thread our st thread our string through for a linear slide, which is like a mechanism that can move up and down or to the side. And then below that, those white parts are called spacers, and that's what you thread the string through for a linear slide on those little metal brackets. And so we actually printed out our spacers already this year, and you can actually print them on whatever color you like, which is, I guess, an added button benefit of printing your own parts. But overall, the ability to save time by printing your own parts is really valuable when it comes to the build process. And then on top of that, we can create our own parts, which is I'm sure what generally comes to mind when you're 3D printing, um, because that allows you to have a huge range of abilities in terms of what you're doing that's so specialized about your bot. Um, for example, on the left, that would be a claw. As you can see, all the parts on that claw are 3D printed, and they're done in such a way that we don't have to rely on the more rigid and inflexible Go Builder or Rev manufactured parts that would kind of limit us in terms of what actions we could take. Uh, the thing in the middle is it's a really simple print uh, that Michael, another person on our team, made last year but it's actually very helpful. We use it to tension the string on our linear slides. And after we made this small adjustment with the small 3D print, we actually had up to 50% less string breakage. So this is an example of how important just these little mo um, modifications can be to improving a design. And then on the right, that's a image from many years ago. It's a hover for one of our wheels. And what's so special about this wheel is that it can actually turn independently of all the other wheels. Uh, so of course, Go Builder and Rev, they weren't really conducive to creating such a complex wheel cover. And so 3D printing allowed us to make this design, which was honestly really novel. It helped us get to Worlds that year. So yeah, 3D printing custom parts is great. 
So most teams usually use standard design for FTC, which are essentially just channels that are placed on our robot and connected through like beams, which we have motors in the middle. But other teams tend to use customizable designs for their robot. And here are some certain advantages for that. So one advantage would be it's more compact. And since it's more compact, that helps with maneuverability and movement through our field. Especially last year, um, it was like our season had like poles in the middle. So we just needed to maneuver around. And our robot was pretty compact for that. So it did the job as well, like pretty good. Another benefit would be like putting more mechanisms in our thing, like our intake and our outtake. It's just more like closer together and it's easier to fix because it's modular in that sense. As for precision, anything like, or like anywhere on our robot can essentially just be replaced with the 3D printed parts. So that makes it really easy. Like when something goes wrong, you can just replace it easy as well. For mounting options, um, in our middle picture over here, you can see that there are a custom place like drill holes in the middle. So we don't have to like do that ourselves, like actually drill it like the CNC machine or our 3D print will do it for us. All right, another benefit to 3D printing is the weight. So one big aspect of our robot games is speed uh, because you want to get between maybe what you want to score and your scoring object as quickly as possible. Uh, so here you can see uh, the weights of different materials. Aluminum is pretty common in um, builds because they're used in the uh, C channels. I know it doesn't say 1.75 millimeters and one meter on the aluminum, but I swear that's right. It just didn't fit right. <laughs> Uh, but as you can see, the aluminum is almost double, if not more, all the others. And so having that lighter weight can be a huge advantage when it comes to speed and shaving down the seconds that you might need to get an extra round of points. Uh, okay, another um, benefit to 3D printing is rapid prototyping. Uh, so as Suwon said a little bit earlier, um, having a 3D printed part means that you can quickly analyze if, if that 3D print part doesn't work, what's the issue, and then quickly remake it and then reprint it. Um, so for an example of that, you can see the drivetrain. This is a, a CAD of Team Infinite Turtles. Um, and this is the robot design from a few years ago, I believe. As you can see, they're constantly changing their design. And due to the fact that they have 3D printed parts, they were able to pretty quickly analyze what issues there were with their current 3D print and then change it. And so that ability to rapidly prototype and come up with improvements uh, was really important. I think one of those changes that you can see is with the slide placement and then also the um, shaft that goes between the slides to move the pixels from the bottom to the top of the robot. One example of our own is actually an example from last year. Last year we used computer vision with a camera to locate um, ob objects in autonomous, which is when the robot can drive by itself. And we had a huge issue trying to figure out where to place it. Uh, and so our solution to that was actually with our cone holder, which is that little black circular, like half circle with the little triangular additions on the right hand side. And we were able to reprint this part to have a place for our camera, which ended up being actually really perfect for what we were doing. And it's just an example of how we were able to make minute changes to our 3D prints to improve them significantly. And so that rapid prototyping aspect of 3D printing is really essential to our build process. Okay, for aesthetics, there's mainly like only benefits of it are essentially just showing your brand as a team. So on the far right, there's uh, 1614, 16461 Infinite Turtles. This team is known for their like complex uh, like 3D print designs, as Sophie mentioned earlier, and they tend to have like some of the most beautiful bots at competition. At the top is our team, uh, 5795. This is from a few years ago. I'm not sure what season, but that must have been a part of our aesthetic. At the bottom, the red robot is from Cut the Red Wire. They're another team in North Carolina, which are really good too, and tend to use CNC bots as well. And then on the very far left, there's frog robots in Germany. So this is an overseas team, and they tend to use like same thing for aesthetics because it's part of their brand as well.
All right. So obviously nothing is perfect. So there are <clears throat> some cons to 3D printing. Um, out of these expenses, honestly, once you get it set up, probably the least big issue. 3D printers can be expensive. Uh, obviously, you're not buying a new one every year. So once you have your 3D printer, that issue is fixed. Um, depending on what type of filament you use, it could get a little more expensive. But using the standard PLA, which you can get off of Amazon, which we do, or a variety of other places, it can be pretty cheap. Um, it's just a cost to be aware of. Um, a more important uh, con of 3D printing is strength. So all the manufactured standard parts that we get from GoBuilda or Rev, as I said before, are typically made out of a metal like aluminum. 3D printing will never live up to the strength of metal. Um, and so in some places, that is an issue because obviously our robot's going to be crashing into things, there'll be friction. And so having the strength of a part could be pretty important when it comes to certain mechanisms or protection. So sometimes it's important to consider whether there's a higher advantage of having a stronger part over a customized one. Uh, next is the size limit. Uh, there's only so big a part that you can build when it comes to 3D printing. It's not usually a huge issue, but CNC, the alternative is limited in its capabilities. And so it's important to consider what it, you're actually capable of printing. And then lastly, 3D printing is difficult to master. Um, it takes some time to learn. It can be expensive to learn. You have to learn about all the fill patterns, the thickness, and all these other settings that may go into 3D printing. And so uh, like anything else, it takes time to learn and it may be more difficult for a beginner to do or a team that's just starting out to learn. So these are some of the printer choices that FTC teams commonly use. Personally, we use an Ender 3 series, which has worked really, really well for us. It has good user interface and settings. It has a print bed that well, hopefully it's adjustable, but uh, it's good adhesion. And we're able to make small improvements to the hardware. It is somewhat more expensive, but it can be shared between the teams and the usability of it overall is helpful. Some other common ones that I've seen are the Prusa and the Bamboo Lab. Um, I know those are pretty popular among other teams. Okay, so Choosing a filament is really important when it comes to your 3D print. Uh, the most common filament that you'll find is PLA, which is, again, what we use. Um, it is really common. It has pretty standard co configuration. It's pretty expensive. Again, we can just get it off of Amazon. Uh, and it does have pretty good strength overall. Uh, some downsides to it is it can be kind of brittle. Uh, in other words, it's really likely to crack. It's not going to be flexible. Um, and it is not UV resistant, so exposure to UV can lead to it cracking. Luckily, that's not a huge issue for us since we're mostly indoors, but it is something to keep in mind when it comes to storage of parts. Petri is probably the um, most, like the second most common used, although once we get into the other three, it, it really is more rare to see teams do this just because they're more difficult to print, and so they require higher amounts of knowledge to print them. Uh, some advantages to PEGI would be its durability and its impact resistance, and especially its layer adhesion, which makes it an overall much stronger print and could be used in much higher friction or uh, tension areas. One issue is that it is hygroscopic, which means it will absorb moisture, which could warp the print. So it's important to keep it in a secure location where that won't be an issue. TPU is probably the most commonly used after that. Um, out of these, it's probably one of the most difficult to print. However, it does have the really big advantage of being flexible and having abrasion resistance, uh, which depending on what you want your part to do could be really, really important. Um, again, like um, PETG, it is hygroscopic, so storing it is really important. And then lastly, ABS. ABS is probably the least commonly used for um, 3D printing in FTC, just because it's more of a industrial well, maybe not industrial, but it, it really has different purposes with its electrical insulation and strength. Um, it can be good, but it doesn't have any particular benefits compared to the other three when it comes to FTC. Um, printing it is something that you should be careful about. It is more complicated um, and it can release styrene fumes and it is more likely to warp. So it is generally much more difficult to work with.
Uh, okay, so some things to keep in mind when it comes to 3D printing and some issues that might show up. Uh, overhangs. Uh, I'm sure you've worked with overhangs before. Um, overhangs is essentially the idea that when you're 3D printing, it's going to be in layers. And if you have a layer that deviates significantly from the main structure, it'll have a hard time drying or finding support, which will lead to this kind of weird warping that you'll see on the right-hand side where the filaments start drooping and they're not as uh, structurally stable and they're not really fitting the form that you assign to them. So a solution to this is um, creating overhangs, uh, which are a slow, gradual incline to get to the certain height that you want. Of course, sometimes that's not easy to achieve. So another alternative to fixing bad overhangs is um, printing it from a different direction. So maybe instead of doing it from top to bottom, you print it from bottom to top because maybe the overhangs in that direction are better. One thing to consider when doing that is the fact that the strength of the build greatly depends on which direction the pressure is put on it. And so if you're putting pressure on the side that has all the filaments stacked up on top of each other, it'll be much stronger than if you're putting pressure on the side of the um, layers, which is significantly less structurally stable. So that is something to take into account when you're thinking about overhangs and which direction you want to print an object from. Tolerances have to do with 3D printing and um, holes for screws or other inserts that you may want to put into your 3D print. Uh, we very, very often have some sort of hole for a screw in our 3D prints. The issue being that depending on the height and the precision, the height of your bed and the precision of your 3D printer, sometimes the prints will be a little bit off when it comes to hole size. So for example, you can see the picture on the bottom um, sometimes the print can expand the filament and it may go a few millimeters over when it comes to printing smaller, uh, more precise holes. So one solution to this is tolerances, or in other words, taking into account that it's not always going to be a perfect 3D print. And so usually when we're making holes for um, a screw or other type of insert, we make them a little bit larger, but maybe by a few millimeters than they need to be with the assumption in mind that the 3D printer will make it a little bit smaller than we told it to. And this is good because we don't really want to hand drill holes into our 3D print. It's possible, but it's messy and it's overall just not as likely to create the clean cut that you're looking for. And so coming up with solutions to these small inaccuracies with 3D printing is pretty important. Okay, slice of settings. I hate slicer settings personally because they're so tedious, but um, slicer settings is what we do when we're um, getting ready to print and we need to put in finalizations for how we want the print to go. The first thing to take into account is wall count. If you see the picture on the right, um, you can see that there's kind of a thicker border around each hexagon. That would be the wall. And so walls are defined as the number of times that the 3D print is creating a line around the exterior of whatever shape that you want to make. Usually we use two just because one is a little too weak for our builds, but for parts that require a higher strength, we usually use three to four. Infill is probably the most important of all the settings. Infill um, is essentially how much you're filling in the inside of solid prints. We usually use 30 to 60% infill just because having too little infill can reduce the internal support and stability of a part, but having too much is just a waste of material. Um, it does add stiffness, so one thing to consider is your part will be less, less flexible if you're using an infill. The main three types of infill are rectangular, triangular, and hexagonal. Typically, we try to avoid um, rectangular infill, such, such as the grid that you can see in the bottom left. They are really, really easy to print, but um, they're not as strong and they're more likely to collapse. They are the only one that can achieve 100% uh, infill, but again, that is something that you generally want to avoid just because it uses up so much filament. Uh, the next one is triangular. Triangular is pretty standard. Uh, it's a fast and easy print, as you can see on the bottom right, just because it happens to occur in straight lines. Uh, in terms of strength, it is quite good at maintaining stability. Um, and it's very unlikely to deform, but the personal, my opinion, the best one to use 
is hexagonal, which can be seen in the cubic and gyroid at the very top. Um, these are mostly irregular shapes, so they do take a longer time to print, but overall they're much, much more stable when it comes to creating a strong build. Other things to take into account would be the speed of your printer. Uh, while everyone wants to have a fast print, um, having a printer go too fast can lead to uh, deformities or warping just because printers do have a cap on how fast they can go. For example, our ender can't go above 80 millimeters per second, so we typically want to run it at a speed somewhat slower than that. Another thing to take into account is temperature and cooling. Uh, depending on which filament you're using, and you should really be researching your filaments to see what properties they have. Some filaments cool at a certain rate, which could impact how easy it is to take off the bed, or some of them actually need some sort of temperature or heating aspect to even shape properly. And so taking that to account is really important. Um, another thing that could be important is your layering height, uh, which is essentially how thick or thin each layer that you have is. Thinner layers take much longer, but usually allow for higher precision. And so depending on your part and how many small aspects it has to it, that could be something important to take into account. And then lastly, of course, software. Uh, we use Fusion 360, as I said before, but there are other softwares out there like Cura and Prusa Slicer. And so finding one that works best for you, that has the settings that you want, uh, can be really integral to creating an easier 3D printing experience. Um, so here's an example of what our Fusion 360 3D printing experience may look like. As you can see, we're using the manufacturer and the model um, workspaces. Um, and so, yeah, once we have this, we could put it into one of our CNC softwares to help come up with a plan on how we want to 3D print this. Or, I apologize. Yeah, how we want to 3D print it or CNC this. Uh, okay, so print bed adhesion. Um, so print bed adhesion refers to how well a 3D print is sticking to your bed, which is what the board or level thing that it's being printed on is called. Um, print bed is really important because if you don't have enough adhesion, the print can slip around, which could lead to it being deformed. But if you have too much, it can be a large issue getting it off of the board, which could lead to potentially damaging it in your attempts to get it off. Um, some ways to improve um, a print that is not sticking to your board, the main one would be adjusting the height of the bed. But if that doesn't work, it's always good to have backups. So that could include using rubbing alcohol or Windex, using a light layer of glue stick, even though that sounds counterintuitive, um, using some glue and water, hairspray, um, or having a raft, which is like this small, in the bottom right corner, it's that blue circle that is going around the 3D print, just because that helps um, add an extra layer so that the print is more likely to stick to the already placed um, layer of filament on the bed. Uh, alternatively, if it's sticking too much, again, the best thing to do is to adjust the height. If that doesn't work, you could lightly spray with water, um, that is something to be careful with depending on how much water your filament can actually absorb. You can lightly tap on the edges or hope that it will come off more easily when it's cooler, which could be helped by putting it in the fridge or the freezer to side it, depending on the size of your build. Uh, overall, just testing to make sure that your print adhesion is good before your 3D printing is pretty important. As you can see, the impact that bad bed adhesion had on the side plate in the middle. So the process we use to make sure that our nozzle is level with our bed is called bed leveling, and it plays a major role in our print adhesion process. So the way that we usually do this is through the paper method, which is just placing paper underneath the nozzle and lowering that nozzle until there's some like resistance when we pull against the paper. So how we like test that typically are creating calibration cubes and skirts, like 3D print skirts, and monitoring the process to make sure all these prints are successful. And if anything goes wrong, we're actually there to stop it. So on the right are some three examples of what happens when your nozzles aren't leveled properly. So on the bottom, it's when it's too low, or to the very left, it's when it's too low, the nozzle's too low. 
And what can happen is like it can break the like actual bed itself and then the nozzle can snap off as well. And then for number two, that would be like a perfect nozzle height. And then number three is just when it's kind of like dropping it on it and it's not actually creating enough like force to stick it together. So there's not enough adhesion over there. And on the bottom, there's another uh, example of what that would look like from a side angle. All right, the last thing to consider when it comes to 3D prints is post-processing. Personally, my team doesn't use much post-processing, but I've definitely seen other teams use it, especially when it comes to the heat set inserts. Although um, some form of smoothing of 3D printing parts can be really useful when it comes to areas with high friction. Uh, so heat set inserts are those little golden things at the top right, and they're essentially built-in threads. So the way that you would install them is you would have a small hole in your 3D print that's about the size of the diameter of your heat set insert. You'd line up your heat set insert in your hole, and then you'd slowly push it in with a soldering iron until it's all the way in. And the benefits of having a heat set insert is that it's much easier to install screws or other mounting options. Um, as said before, sometimes you just drill a hole in or you force a screw in to a hole that's already existing. The issue with that being that the plastic is pretty likely to deform over time. And so the heat set inserts provide a long-term option to safely have a um, thread. Heat set inserts are particularly good with thermoplastics that can melt just because it goes well with the aspect of the heat set insert melting into the plastic. When it comes to the three ways to smooth down a 3D print, there's annealing, vapor smoothing, and epoxy coating. I can't really speak to which of these is better. It really just depends on your preference. Um, but these are all ways that teams help reduce friction on parts that may be in high stress areas. Annealing is usually used to improve firmness, tensile strength, and heat resistance. It's what you're seeing at the top with the labeled PLA, PEGI, uh, ABS, etc. One thing to note is that it can somewhat deform the shape and the size of your 3D print. And so taking into account how that may impact your print is important. However, it can be really helpful when it comes to reducing cracking and internal stress in your print, so it can be beneficial if you know what you're doing. Now, the second one would be vapor smoothing, which is on the bottom left with the owl. And as you can see, it just adds a nice shiny coating to it and decreases friction significantly, which is very similar to epoxy coating, which is what's on the right hand side. Unlike vapor smoothing, um, I would say it's a little easier since you're not uh, using any vaporized solvents, so it, it's just easier appliance and I would say safer to use since you really don't want to be <laughs> inhaling those things. Um, but it does increase the strength and the smoothness of a part, which can be really helpful when it comes to, again, those high friction areas. And um, yeah, that is our presentation. So thank you. Can y'all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. First off, great presentation. Like, round of applause, standing ovation, because it was very thorough, <clears throat> very well explained. Um, and at the same time, you guys did a great job of breaking down every step. So, especially for people who are, like you said, just, just getting into or um, new to this 3D printing world, very good job. Um, I'm gonna let you ask questions, but I want to go back over your presentation just to like address like a few things. If um, you go back to some of the slides, because <clears throat> I remember some things, but not everything. Um, so like, if you go all the way back to the beginning, sorry, I should have probably uh, talked, but y'all are doing a really good job. I didn't want to interrupt. Um, the first thing I remember is. The flutes. Okay, so the difference, there's no difference between flutes and drill bits. Um, so, like you said on the slide before this, I think, no, on the slide right here, where you like flutes are similar to drill bits. Um, flutes are just the teeth. A drill bit versus a mill bit, or um, a drill bit versus a, yeah, an end mill bit or a mill bit is different in the type of flutes that they have, like you were saying, because of the chip extraction. But the teeth themselves, those two, three, four um, teeth, like you were describing, those are the flutes. And so like you explained, everything else is perfect. Differences in the flutes and what they do. 
Um, but for, I guess, syntax correct correction, flutes are just the teeth. Like they don't actually have anything to do with the bit itself. Mill bits have, um, I think it's like a, a flat bottom, and drill bits have a pointed bottom so that they can bite into the the uh, material, and then the flutes will cut and extract. Whereas, or that's a drill bit, <clears throat> and then a mill bit might be flat around it so that it can be. Um, run across the surface easier, uh, but everything else on the flutes was great. Um, if you go forward um, on your slide, CNC. Okay, go back to the CNC slide real quick. Um, yeah, everything was good on this slide too. Keep going. Uh, keep going. Keep going. Oh, and then okay. So the next thing was. I would reorder the slides that you did for your bed leveling um, embed adhesion. I would come, yeah, so like I would put the bed leveling and adhesion before. Mm. When you did your slide about showing the process that you guys go through, so I think it's two slides before this. Yeah, like the software used. So, um, Putting the bed leveling and stuff up above some of these slicer settings and the software because it is a, a physical thing like you guys were talking about when you went through the plastics and then you went through the pros and cons of printing and some of those attributes that you have to understand to go through 3D printing process, putting bed leveling before you start talking about software because software is really the end all of the process. Um, like you were saying, slicer, slicer settings are very, very, very uh, complex or can get very complex and so it gets it's at the very end of a of the design like you've already did everything and even if you've already calibrated your materials in your bed and uh, the pad design has been vetted in the in the system then you come to slicer and you print but before you do any of that like you you should probably test your bed leveling like you guys were saying you did um, but that's just a, a, a preference like everything else was good though it's not it didn't throw off anything or anything like that. Um, to speak to your infill too, um, <clears throat> so um, they did a study, like uh, someone someone has a PhD on this, honestly, but um, when 3D printing came out, they did a study to show that four to five walls with no infill is equivalent to two to three walls with specific types of infill. And so when you have parts that are not weight or not weight but aren't load bearing you can get away with being just as rigid with four to five walls and no infill versus two to three walls with infill and so you guys want to just want to think about that if you're talking about the cost or your plastic consumption um and then also i will work with you guys to get if you need help but 80 millimeters a second is not slow it's by any means but enders should be able to go somewhere around like 110, 120. Um, and that's not a necessity. But if you do run into the problem of you need to get parts out faster, and so it's just taking you guys a long time because you do are, you are doing a lot of printing, um, that could help. And then I can work with you trying to get some of those slicer settings and some of those bed settings, not beds, uh, heat settings correct, so that you can get some of these prints to go faster. Because like you said, it is really all in the slicer. Um, one of the things with slicers that people don't know, because it's not necessarily intuitive when you just start picking up 3D printing, is that there's a lot of math that the software does in general or in the background to make sure that the flow out is equal to the area displaced on the bed, and then they and so they do that through some um, integrated equations that aren't necessarily. Uh, like on the screen, like it, it might ask you for, for instance, like what is the gap that you want between each line laid down? And that gap, you might put like maybe it's 300 microns because your diameter of your nozzle is 400 microns. So you're going to go with half. So you get 100 microns of overlap. And so at that point, you're expecting everything to be flat. But when you do it, you see maybe that um, 100 microns of overlap is, is too much. And so now you go back and you reduce that gap. But when you reduce that gap, you get, uh, what you would hope is that you would get no no overlap at all and so that ridge or that that meeting point is not raised but sometimes what you see actually is 
no difference at all because it's a mathematical equation and it's not a physical thing that um the machine understands it's not it, it doesn't it calculates the i guess coordinates and it changes them mathematically and so even though you mathematically are in the same spot because your flow rate was not decreased or your heat was not decreased you still have that overlap there um and so that's just some of those things that when you go to like trying to perfect parts um it comes down to being understand that some of those flow rate values are just uh figurehead values like they don't actually do anything and so how do you control those values even though you're changing the number and nothing's changing going back and understanding some of the qu equations that go into calculating those flow rate values is what you actually need to change and then when you go to change those what you'll see is your print gets substantially better um and then so that goes to talk about your tolerances um you did a really great job um <clears throat> of, ex of explaining the different types of materials that people can print with i would shy away from making a claim that 3d printed materials can't be as strong as aluminum um, unless you tag it with a caveat that you're talking about FDM plastics only, because there are metal 3D printers, um, glass 3D printers, um, concrete 3D printers. And so you do have the ability to have parts as strong as aluminum, but because of your material, you will not. And so everything else that you said about that was spot on great, but I would just shy away from saying that unless you add the plastics part, just because um, someone could take that wrong. but uh pla versus abs uh like you said abs can be difficult to print that's kind of for some reason i think pla is super hard to print like i can't really print pla very well um but abs is my best friend uh pet g you talked about that that's really good um and then tpus obviously if you're not having a flexible material it's really nothing that you need but when you talk about um the material type and choosing pla versus all of these other ones make sure especially with pla pla is not it's it's cheap and that, that's a great thing and like you were saying the abs does does release those fumes and so it can be a little bit uh uncomfortable to work with because of the smell um but abs is is beyond stronger and so if you are going for a rigid part that's where you saying okay like like if you were to make the claim we did this step and we use this infill because it reduced plastics. If I was, and I'm not, I don't, I'm not coming from a judge perspective, but from the materials perspective, I would ask, okay, did you think about switching materials? Because if you switched to ABS over PLA, maybe you could have got the same strength in a three wall, 20% infill that you got with a four wall, 45% infill with ABS compared to PLA. And so that's just something that it's no need to print ABS if, you're very, if, you're, if your system's already set up and everything's good with PLA, stay there. But if you do run into problems where you're, you're increasing the infill, you're increasing the wall th uh, thicknesses, and you're still not seeing the things that you want, think about trying to switch to plastics just because ABS structure is uh, much bigger and, and much stronger once it um, returns back to that solid form than PLA and you, it, the, you're talking about like hundreds of pounds difference in some of the load bearing qualities that ABS can um, achieve. But also to talk to um, the infill. Okay, the infill. When choosing your infill, like you guys are saying, um, yeah, I don't really use rectangular at all. Um, it's either honeycomb, uh, it's honeycomb, gyroid, or your trihex trihexagonal, like you were saying, um, or triangle. Really, like if, if you're gonna go with a normal rectangular grid infill, you might as well just you 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 are better off using a triangular infill because triangles are stronger than squares, and it's that simple. But hexagonal is is the best, and then gyroid or gyroscopic um, infill is for parts that have flexion or bending. If you have anything that has a bend or it needs to compress or it needs to have some type of um, flexibility in that part, gyroid infill is the one that you should use because the infill, that gyroid infill is built to handle flexibility and torsion or, or any type of um, bend in your part. Whereas the other structures, 
they're there to resist and, and to keep that thing, that structure um, solid. And so at that point, what you're going to get is those forces going through and against the structure and having to resist opposed to the structure working with those forces um, due to the infill. But this slide was really good because not a lot of people know about the infill differences. And so speaking on that is is like it's paramount really like you you really got to explain this to people especially when you go to talk about your design because when you have a design that wins with the same part as someone else's it might have lasted longer it might have outperformed it for no other reason than you had a better infill which is um, equivalent to just like a materials density and or material properties like you, if you think about it from um like a, chem a chemical perspective, if you could compare it to the differences in like water versus ice, like one is solid, one is liquid, yes. But that difference and those differences in properties can be achieved the same way in 3D printing with you changing the infill. And so that was really good that you guys mentioned that. Um, to go back to your uh, slide about the overhangs and the direction that you print, which you would want to say, everything you said was right. What you but uh, not but but everything you said was right and how I would say what you said um, more concisely was when you print anything the let me say this better anything that you print the weakest okay yeah the weakest axis that you printed in will be no the weakest direction of your part will be the axis that you printed your part in. So um, any part that's printed from the bottom up, it'll be weakest in that Z axis every single time. And so you guys talked about orienting your parts to fix some of the overhangs. And so just be aware that if you do flip it or you turn it on its side, now you now have a new face or bottom plane that your part is on. And so now the Z axis uh, in, in correlation to your part is different. And so now that Z axis that the part was printed it printed in is going to be the axis in which that part is weakest in. So also think about that, whatever load bearing part that you have, the, the, the part that the, the, the direction that the load of that part that it will handle, make sure that it is perpendicular to the Z axis to ensure that your part is going to be as strong as it actually can be. Um, also fans, um, when you talk about overhangs, you talked about your overhangs and um, you did mention that you could change the orientation and the temperature. Um, if you don't want to use supports because supports are a pain, everyone knows that it's very much a pain. Fans and the cooling speed or just the speed of your print alone can change your overhangs and what you see. And I think you mentioned that as well. So that's really good. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, that you guys understood from like a mechanical perspective, whatever direction you print your part in, the Z direction will always be the weakest. Um, and then going back to tolerances, that was another thing. Okay, so everything that you talked about with 3D printing was spot on. Like, like I said, you have a beautiful presentation. The tolerances of 3D printing are very problematic. So, and it's, it's, it's so, so problematic that some engineers will shy away from trying to incorporate 3D printed parts into the final design. Because when you go get this part designed, like you guys said, I think you said Michael made that string tensioner. And his string tensioner was a very simple part on paper um, or in the CAD modeling process. And so it truly could be a part that you guys take and go give to um, a McMaster or some type of big... Uh, not make master, but a, a big machining shop, and they could go make this part out of sheet metal, and they could give you guys a thousand of them, and they could they could replicate it very easily. But when you go to do tolerances, the pro the, the significance in tolerances, like you have here specifically, is that when you design a part in CAD, it's dimensioned in three D space, uh, mathematically, geom geometrically, however you want to say it. When you go to three D print it. Everything stays the same until you slice. When you slice, that slicer takes the geometric shape or layout or whatever you want to say of your part and it um, cuts it into triangles. That's just what it is. And so that's the slicing part. It slices the whole thing into triangles. Um, the, that's a bunch of math that's not really necessary, but the triangles are the easiest thing for it to do it in. 
And those triangles, like you have in the circumscribed circle here, triangles are not curved. And so you get this space that is usually left out. Tolerances with 3D printing, when you go to, um, when you go to switch from a 3D printed model to anything that's machined, that's where a lot of people, a lot of engineers are like, I, it's very difficult to get the tolerances for your machine precise enough for you to be able to accurately uh, repeat that design, I guess. And so that's that was something that you guys talked about. And the tolerances are, like you said, usually bigger than what you actually um, designed. And that has to do only with your layer height and your initial starting. So the initial starting layer height, your layer height for the, res the rest of the print, and then how much filament diameter you're putting out. So if you have a 400 micron nozzle, you're usually printing in around 400 microns. But like you know, as you, as you switch that plastic, it's gonna go out further than 400 microns. And so ac accounting for that difference is where you lose all ability to control your tolerances. And so the rule of thumb that we worked with is whatever you design, design it, especially when you have holes for heat set inserts, anything that's gonna be uh, combined with another part, like you guys showed the um, design that you had all the things from the library put into place, any type of connected design like that, all of your connecting parts that need to be lined up or whatever, always design them half the diameter of your nozzle under. Yeah, so if you have a hole that's three millimeters diameter, so that you can put a M2.5 M bolt through it, you want to design that part at not three, but 2.8 millimeters um, in diameter. So that way that when it does print, it will be a three millimeter hole. And then say you did that and you didn't get the correct translation from three to two, or 2.8 to three, it was like 2.8 to 3.2, then you know you need to just go back and just try and go that way. But that's some of the ways that you can like look at trying to tighten up those tolerances because the whole point of 3D printing is to be able to produce a part that has never been made, but then you do want to create that part and either sell it or use it for real in a industry or, or system of machine. And so it's gonna have to be machined because machining is a faster way of producing things right now. And so that is where you get this, like how to translate it over to that. Um, everything else though, that you talked about with tolerances, great job. Um, and then go forward one more, a few more slides, just to make sure I got everything. Um, vegetation, yeah. Perfect, okay. Um, and then, so yeah, like everything that you guys talked about, like I said, it was a really good presentation. It was very thorough. You went through every part of 3D printing, which is it, like, it's important like you said like everything from material choice to the printer you use to the bed whether it's a glass or an aluminum piece or a steel piece to the slicers that you use to um, your overhangs your settings your orientations all that was really good to be able to design and build out this part that you guys are talking about um, one thing i would i would say or ask is if you do need to explain anything to anybody about your design in a um, competition or judge setting having a simulation piece will be bar none like you don't have to explain anything really after you have that simulation piece and simulation can be difficult to learn especially if you're getting into new new into catting and so by all means reach out i can help you with that but being able to show okay i've made this piece and maybe it's just that simple uh, tension, uh, string tension of that micro design. And you run it through a simulation and you say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna show the forces on that. That right there explains everything that you need to show and it lets people know that you've done the, the back work to show why this design is better and why it should work. And at that point, you can also put in a type of material, um, a density or a weight. And so you can kind of get close to a real approximation of what you would expect when you print something with a certain amount of walls and a certain amount of infill. And then all of that combined goes into your design. And that's where you get this very, very, very nice optimization of a piece or a part. Um, and it works just, it just works better. But um, it's not necessary. It's more so for 
validity like when you go to tell someone about this or if there's questioning in your design or why you did something that really validates what you did in a mathematical sense and so there's no room for opinion or argument there but other than that it's not necessary as far as you need to run simulation on your on your designs for them to work 3d printing is is i tell everybody all the time it's a toy like it's a grown person's toy so you you play around you print some stuff it doesn't work you go back you redesign you print it again it didn't work you keep doing that until it does work and there's not really a, a, a method that you need to follow to fix that. You're kind of just eyeing what you see and fixing what you, you don't like. Um, but when you come time to explain that, that's where simulation can kind of help bear some of that weight for you. So you don't have to just explain all of your opinions or all of your processes. You can just go say, look, we ran simulation. This is what we saw. So this is what we did because of what we saw. But um, everything else was really good. Like all of you guys like really impressed with the presentation and like the direction that y'all are going in um but if y'all have any questions for me i'm gonna let that be i'm gonna open up open that up to you guys but again really great job um and if you need anything let me know okay thank you so much actually i have a question yep. uh, my question would be based off of, like what you see that we're doing how does that translate over to like what you do as a career a job your research all right, so, um, yeah, I probably should start with that. I'm sorry. I haven't met you guys, but I met Sophie. So my background is in biobiology. Um, I have a background in biology, bioengineering, um, but I went and worked for a company that did research and development, and their research and development was, was, was solely focused on doing everything that you can do now, but just with 3D printers. So making a scale that you step on away yourself but there's no electronic parts everything's 3d printed making a pin that you write with but there's no spring and the ink is already in place when you print the uh, pin making implants like uh, cornea implants or knee implants uh, for your cartilage or any type of tears that you have so like an acl mcl lcl um so i've done stuff like that and um those were that's really where bear, the, that's really where my background is in is bioprinting or printing for the biological applications but i've done a bunch of embedded work in electronics um 3d printing of microelectronics or embedded electronics and so that's kind of where some of the stuff you guys are doing comes in so like you guys could print like you said um i'm gonna keep using the tensioner because it's a simple design a, a simple piece but like you could take that sensor i mean that tension tensioner and you could print it with an, uh, a strain gauge inside, or you could print it with some type of um, sensor inside because it's just the sensors that you have now that are made are just wires, and you can translate or not translate, but you can switch out those wires with conductive in, uh, paste. And so, what you have now the ability to do is make in situ embedded electronics in the same way that you would a pcb board but now you have the complexity of 3d printing and it, it takes you into a, a very different space but um 3d printing as a tool is i would i would put it akin to like modeling of like programming you don't necessarily lose anything or gain anything by saying I can 3D print until you can show the application. So it's like, I know how to do Python, but I don't know what I'm writing a Python script, or I can I know C or Java, or I can do all the CSS, whatever you want to talk about, but there's no application. And so you put that down on your resume or anything like that, and it doesn't necessarily translate unless you've shown how you've done something in that space. And so what you guys are doing, 3D printing, this this robot and this machine um we use 3d printing 3d printers like i was saying for embedded electronics that's really where i would connect this back to and so everything that you did we did the exact same thing went through the exact same steps of downloading libraries using a uh cad software going through and measuring tolerances and going back and forth between the material types and the designs and then going back and figuring out once all that stuff worked in the 3D printing regime, now I need to get it to where the tolerances of my 3D print are correct enough for me to send this to a machine shop. Or now that I need everything 
3D printed. I don't need to make it out of a machine shop. How do I get it compatible with an off the shelf electronic device or microchip so that I can embed it? And so that was, that is the path that you guys are on most directly right now. Um, but the research that I do currently is focused on bioprinting. Um, and I say bioprinting because that's just the word, but it's, it's not, we're not printing anything biological per se. Like we're, we're making a device to print biological things. I would like to print uh, structures and scaffold, tissue scaffolds for larger pieces of tissue for drug administration testing. And so being able to do that, um, we need a different type of valve. And so that comes back into the CAD design, like you guys were talking about. How do we design a valve to be able to do that? Um, I talked to Sophie before um, about some of the projects we we have that we're working on here with um, Electra, not Electra, but wet spinning, um, using a, a wet spin process, which is just like, uh, if you think about a spider and how it makes thread or its web, it's the same type of uh, system. And then recreating that system to spin out fibers that are embedded with either drugs to help you heal or some type of um, drug to help increase the fat, the rate of your cell growth or repair so that you can use it for bandages or, uh, or, or any type of application like that. Um, some of the other things we're doing right now, though, um, that are mechanically driven are like we're building a HARV, <clears throat> which is a um, microgravity device. So we want to build a device that uh, si simulates microgravity, and then we're going to put cells in there, and we want to see how that works. We also have an acoustic separation device, um, very different from some of all based in the same process of you guys doing. So it's just like you take an idea, how do I create this idea? Now I need to go into CAD and draw it up. And then from the drawings that you can do in CAD and, and the pieces that you can put together in there, you can now go test this idea. Um, and so as an engineer, it is, is a, I would put it as essential as it is to drafting. If you were like an architect or in the old days, if you were an engineer, you'd have to draw these things out. So it's just like, this is the new way of drawing. And so learning to CAD and being able to do that efficiently. And when I say efficiently, it's, it's not a, a race, like no one's going to tell you, you need to have this part done in three days, but your efficiency and it come, it, 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 it's it, you, you'd be surprised. Like people who do this for real, they have the, the huge mouses, you know, the big screens, things like their keyboards and mouses are, are key, keystroke identified and all that stuff so that they can move very quickly through designing because as you guys know, it's a tedious process. Everything has to be from the ground up and everything is very specific. So being able to do that process efficiently to you, because no one's going to know how fast you can do it and no one's going to compare your speed to their speed. It's a how fast can you get this done? That part right there is is very critical for you to been, then be able to put that on your resume and say, okay, well, I can do cat design. Because then they put you in a position like me where they're like, okay, I have this project. I want you to do this thing. How would we do it? You're going to be the one to figure out the design. You're going to be the one to come up with how you should or how you think this should work. And so you being able to be you being able to iterate through a bunch of designs before you go give them a final design or a draft of one of your prototypes, it comes back to how fast you can draw or how fast you can CAD things. And so that is where this step or this this um, tool that you guys are learning, it's super big. Like you can get a job just CADing. People get paid like seventy thousand dollars at least to just draw stuff for big companies. So it's not a small tool by any means. Like this is, y'all are doing something that is like, as you already know, it's, it's, it's a big deal. All right, I guess, does anyone else have like any questions about 3D printing or maybe like how it ties into what Evan does? I have one question. Yep. So you're talking about bioprinting and different mechanics like electronics, like paired with 3D printing. Mm -hmm. So what's the testing design or the, the ways that you approach those? Because obviously the human body is very complex. So how do you mitigate those like mechanical parts? 
Oh, great. Yes, no, great question. So it's it's the material. Um, so we can get into a very deep discussion about that, but to save you, because no one wants to be bored on a Saturday, um, the material is different. We don't use plastics, we use liquids, and then we link those liquids um, with another chemical liquid that causes it to harden and so um, or solidify. You guys use plastics, um, thermoplastics specifically, and so that's those plastics are based off of TG or your glass transition temperature. Um, and so you get a plastic that melts or changes from it's solid to a little bit less solid or bendable flowy state. And that's based off of the TG of your, your material. And so that then allows you to curate structures um, based on how fast you, you heat it up and then how fast it can cool due to its environment. And so you get that, that's how y'all are 3D printing. When you go to bioprint, you, like you said, you're trying to replicate what's inside the body or you're trying to be able to make something that is, um, what's that word? It's not toxic, uh, it doesn't, it, it, it's compatible with the body. And so you're using liquids that are already, uh, I don't call them biodegradable, biocompatible. Um, alginates, uh, PEG, hydrogels, um, I'm using ionic liquids, but the main thing, especially even with like, even with electronics that go into the body, um, they just need to be encapsulated or in, uh, covered by something so that you don't have metal that is degradable in the body degrading and then your, your sensor breaking off or your sensor failing and start functioning. Um, most of our bioprints that we do come in the shape of very amorphous objects. Like they look a lot less structured than what you guys are doing because we want the cells or whatever thing we're putting inside to then form that structure or we're just using 3D printing to make a scaffold and then we're gonna put cells on top of it and the cells will make the shape that they naturally make um, by design. And so mitigating any type of toxicity or making sure things are biocompatible, things do, don't biodegrade if we don't want them, or if they do need to biodegrade, making them biodegradable. All of that is in our material design, our army, um, not design, material selection. And then from that, the same process comes out of CAD. We'll go in, we'll draw the same exact structure you guys go draw. We'll come in, we'll do the same type of iterative steps. We might make it with plastic first to see how it looks. But then when we go look, I mean, when we go to print it, we're not using a um, FDM head, which is your standard uh, aluminum or, or brass nozzle, not aluminum, but brass nozzle that's attached to a heater block of some sort. And then filament is being fed into that heating, changing into its flowy plastic state or flowy fluid state. And then it rehardens immediately on to the bed. We're going in and we're using a syringe pump usually um, or some type of uh, pneumatic driven uh, extrusion method. And so now you're pushing out fluids that are liquid and as you guys know liquids don't really hold shape unless they're in a container and so you have to control how fast that liquid stays a liquid and becomes a solidified either solid or gel is really what it comes down to usually they're usually gels and so that process is different going back into slicing that is a very different process from your parts than from our parts the slicing is is huge because the materials are very very different um, but that would be like like I said, the biggest difference. I see. Thank you so much for the input. And also, you're talking about all these different types of, like our robotics 3D printing is very different from the industrial grade way of manufacturing. So what are different types of technologies that you use? Or like you're when you're talking about 3D printing itself and the slicing or modeling in CAD, what type of technologies do you use in that sense? Yeah, no, great question. Um, let me think about Slicer real quick for sure. Um, so off the bat, off top, what I will tell you is we use lasers. Um, lasers are really cheap, right? People don't, some people don't know how cheap powerful lasers are, but you can get some very powerful lasers that the FAA does not like. You can get some very powerful lasers that shoot through balloons and off of Amazon for like $15, $20. But 
when you incorporate those lasers into the same process that a CNC machine does or, or an FDM machine does, which is that um, X Y that Cartesian X Y Z um, graphing of a shape that is broken into triangles, you get the same results. But with lasers, what you have the ability to do now is either mold or not mold, but weld kind of weld with air quotes um, parts together, or you can even use it like a CNC and you can cut things out. But your precision is the size of your laser beam. And so that is a little bit more science to try and figure that out, like spot size and power density and all that stuff. But we use the lasers to achieve micron sized features that you not that you normally could not achieve in like the normal or conventional 3D printing or CNC way. Like you were saying, when you go to CNC something and you choose a bit, the flutes are super important, but at the same time, they break a lot because your bits are also, also often kind of small or are very thin. And so what you have is a tolerance problem of how much that bit can take and the speed it can go at with the part that you're trying to create. And so how we got around some of that was using lasers. Um, we use lasers to cut stuff out. We use lasers to weld things together. We use lasers to um, really those two things are the most, the, the main things, but you can use lasers to uh, etch a surface. If you need to make it chemically resistant or chemically functional, you can use a laser to functionalize that sometimes um, with other things like we use plasma etching, um, but the main difference when you go from like 3D printing as a, as a, as a, like I said, it's a toy, like they're toys. But when you go from that to industrial 3D printing, because you can go get a job and be a six figure engineer 3D printing at the right company, that process of slicing and of CAD is very different. You can build a 3D printer that is more high tech, has more tools, its precision is better. It might be able to move faster than the ender that you guys have, but it functionally works the exact same. And so then how do you get that optimized quality or that optimized part is in the slicing and in the um, design of your part. And so uh, simple things like how I said, it's like it was most overhangs are known to be a problem above 45 degrees is what they tell you in the community. They say, okay, anything that's over 45 degrees overhang is going to have that drooping and stringing effect that you have a problem with. And then you go back and say, okay, well, I need to print something that's at 72 degrees. Well, 72 degrees is not going to be such a problem if you change the orientation, but it's like, what if it is 45, I'm not 45, but 55 degrees or 63 degrees. And so now your overhang is kind of going to be it's in the middle, no matter what direction you should, you flip the chart in and you're going to still have that stringing. And so how do you fix that? And what we found is like, you can go back and change. Um, what is it? What is it? It's like, there's a parameter on the slicer that allows you to control the gap distance that your part is sliced into. And so what I mean when I say is like, if you have a circle and it slices it into or a square, let's say a square, if you have a square and you slice it into triangles, the amount of distance between points you can you can change from like let's just say it's one micron up to 12 microns or 100 microns and so like if i change that distance from 100 microns down to one micron now what you're telling the system is any point that's within one micron of each other is the same point opposed to any point that's 100 microns within each other is the same point point. and so what you can get then is a little bit more precision but when you do that, what you end up with is a lot more triangles. It slows your computer down a lot for sure, um, depending on your part complexity. But when you go print now, because you know that every point is only different if it's over one micron uh, further away from the next point. And so your triangles are actually as compact as you can. And that goes back into like things like packing density um, and structures of material science that we only talk about. But Understanding that and then going back in and saying, okay, so because my part is now sliced into, let's just say a thousand triangles opposed to 400 triangles, the flow rate that needs to be achieved over this plane of whatever slice you're talking about needs to be changed because 
and then you can go to a bunch of reasons. Like you're gonna have um, you're gonna have your un your unsmooth surface because you might be putting too much out as you print. And you run into the problem of um, what do they call that? Uh, Uh, additional heat is really what it is. It's additional heat, like any type of any type of heat. So, like additional heat being this: if your bed is 100 degrees, because or not 100, you're, you're printing PLA, so your bed is probably like 60 degrees. Um, as you print on that bed, it's gonna feel 60 degrees constantly. As you move up, it's gonna feel less of that 60 degrees, obviously. So, as you get into like let's just say the middle regime of your your print you're not necessarily holding that print at 60 degrees constant. So as that print is getting made now, you went from a thousand or a thousand triangles down to 400 or in the reverse, you went from 400 up to a thousand. Now you're having more residual heat in that area. And so now your plastic's not going to get out of that TG area as fast. And so what you're gonna have is a softer plastic. And so as you lay that next layer, it's not fully formed. And so now it's it's going to affect the layer above it. But at the same time, that layer above it is not feeling the same heat that the layer below it felt when it was being printed. And so now it's going to be deformed in some way. And so going back and like trying to optimize those things and going through the slicer uh, settings and understanding how the slicer settings are calculated. And that's what I was saying. Like I can work with you guys on that. That's not something that is it's not difficult. They're, they're, they're algebraic very simple differential equations you're not talking about hard calculus or anything like that it's very much so ax equals y type of thing um but that is where you go from 3d printing being a toy to 3d printing being a tool and being able to use that tool in some sort of industry um that and that was like that's the long way of saying like it's it's all in that slicer and like there are different slicers that you can use um, open source and not open source to help you achieve some of those things. Thank, thank you so much for that. That was a lot of information. You're talking about different slicers, talking about different technologies, and about how the materials affect those. And I, like, it amazes me how deep you can go into like the microns and you can change just little, little tiny distances to achieve a whole different result in the whole, in the whole result as like if you're for the parts that you're trying to make. So another question that I had was about, so you're talking about bioprinting and different like prosthetics or implants that you would do. So for a knee implant, how would, how long does it usually take like the time span from the start of the design to the ending finalized, oh, this is the implant type thing? So great question. Now, it depends on what you're trying to actually achieve. So if you're making an implant, um, and so okay so let's back up because everyone when, when when you tell somebody who and it's not a this is not it's not known because we have not done this i don't want you to think it's not known because it's, it's like you don't know this like no one in the world let me not say it like that very few people in the world have actually shown successfully how you can translate this bioprinted thing into a instant implantable device it's a very like hazy, you know, murky little environment. And so very, very few people who do research are very strong proponents of we can bioprint something that implants directly into the body. When you print anything that's bioprinted, what you're doing is making a, a map basically to help the cells understand what they need to do better. They know what they need to do by design through the DNA and everything that they have, but when you put them in a path that is already made for that design that they already know that they need to do, it helps. It sometimes can help them, but at the same time, it can also just reinforce some of the things that they need to just grow. And so you get them just being in a happier place. Um, I would explain it like no one wants to go to school outside, sitting in a field that's 30 degrees where it's raining and it's cold. Yeah, you might learn something, but because the environment what you're learning is, is, is not happy, you're not going to learn a lot. But if I put you in the middle of, you know, a cozy room with a bunch of food and a cool chair, and now you're sitting there comfortable, yeah, you might fall asleep, but at the same time, you're probably going to want to pay attention a little bit more because you're not worried about freezing. And so that's kind of where bioprinting 
that's what the analogy for bioprinting is, is that we just want to take the cells off of plastic, put them in a more conducive environment for them to grow. And then that should help either speed up the growth or make them grow in a better way than they did if they weren't um, in the body naturally. But that process of printing something, putting cells in, we don't ever usually go past 30 days. And that's not because um, the cells die or anything like that. Sometimes they do. Sometimes it is a, a viability thing. But after 30 days, what you're looking at then is maintenance. You're not looking at the production. If you're trying to produce a structure to implant, that's within the first 30 days. And so you would make something and you would implant the cells. That might be day one or day zero is usually how we say that. So day zero is we've made the device. Let's just say if we go back to Michael's tensioner, if Michael's tensioner is something that we're going to put in the body, we made that day zero. We embedded the cells at the same time that we printed that. Day zero now, from zero to day four or zero to day seven, depending on what cells you have, that's kind of that critical incubation period of are your cells going to live? If they make it out of that little period, now you're in a different regime. You're trying to go from um, they lived to now how do we keep them alive? And then from either day four or day seven, you're going up to either day 10 or day 14. And then after that, you're really just seeing, okay, at day 10, they lived, they made it. Okay, how, how, how dense are the cells? How close are they together? Are they happy? Did they look stressed? Are they putting off biomarkers or biochemicals that lets you know uh, they don't like their environment or they need more of something in their environment versus, uh, uh, day 14 of the same cell line everything is good but now they're too dense and so everything is everything is the same looking but the biomarkers and what you're getting off of them is letting you know hey we're getting into a space that we don't like and your design is not allowing us to do what we want to do and so we're going to start to die they will let you know that um the the timeline like you're saying like how long does it take it's, it's not a like i said it's not a a cookie cut process for anything because no one has really made something that is that optimized yet to be just directly implanted but what you're looking at is usually a a thing like his tensioner you embed the cells the cells grow you see them grow they become happy they become stable and then at day 14 they're stable and let's just say they go up to day 30 they grow to let's just say 60 to 80 percent density inside that structure and so now what you're going to say is, let me take this structure and go test. So now I'm going to go take the stru structure and go mechanically test it. I'm going to pull on it if it's a ligament. Um, if it's a heart valve, I'm going to go try and pump it and try to put fluid through it. We're going to see if it bursts. We're going to see if it can handle the, the tension of flow or the pressures of flow. We're going to see if um, it wears down over time, hysteresis. But... All of those things is after you've got the, the cells and your structure stable. And then as soon as you've done that and you've proven that they're stable, the, the, the hope, you know what I'm saying? Because very, not very many people have gotten that far is to then take that data, that design, and go give it to a clinical, um, a clinician or a clinical uh, organiz organization and see if they can validate that with human samples. And so I said human samples with um, animal samples. Um, sometimes you can do that also, but if you can't, then you go give it to somebody who can, they do that. And then once you get to that part, now you've been uh, cleared to go try to test that in humans. And that's where you get this long process. So like your design is a 30 day, let's just say it's 30 days. But after 30 days, you're going to look at almost two to three years before you can actually implant anything into a human just because of the testing that needs to be done to validate that before you do that process. I see. Yeah, it's a very long process then. Yeah. Just, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a long process to validate. Like if you want to put cells into something, like we made a cornea um, for cornea implants and people don't really think about that because it's like, oh, it's, it's, it's part of your eye, but it's like, it's a very small part of your eye. You're not having to remove the eye or anything like that, but being able to make the cornea and then being able to see if it flexed, you can think of it like a contacts almost, contact lens, being able to see if it could do some of those properties, it was optically clear, you, it, you know, it didn't degrade when you put it in the conditions of the eye, it could handle uh, tears, 
That was one of the things we had to test, like could it handle tears? Did it degrade during tears? Could it handle blinking? Um, all of those things, that's like, once you get your design and you've tested out the design, you're looking at maybe two or three weeks of testing out some of the biological conditions that it needs to go into and then validating that if you have to put cells, that the cells live and all of that. But um, the, like I said, the design part is just the same as y'all. It's, it's no different than what you're doing, but at the same time, you do have to put, uh, this, you're trying to put this into a body. And so someone has to validate that for you, for you to do that. I see. So lots of there's like, there's a lot of connections between industries right here and different subjects like biology and engineering and mechanical engineering and the material testing as you're talking about. So what type of degrees do people in this industry usually have or what type of degrees do you recommend or do you have to go into this industry? So, okay, I would ask you, I would ask this then, are you trying to stay like, do you, and I'm, this is to everybody, do you like 3D printing so much that you want it to be part of your job? Is that what you're saying? It was just an inquiry, so. Okay. You, yeah. yeah, no, so, okay, so to that, like, any type of material science background, um, mechanical engineering, obviously, is, is the number one. But any type of material science, um, bioengineering, this is how we make stuff. If you go type, talk, if you go talk to a bioengineer, not biomedical engineer, but a bioengineer, most of the times they know very little about engineering. They understand how to make engineering compatible with biology. That is their specialty. They don't know the difference between um, why you would use a hex bolt versus uh, a star bolt. They don't understand the torque that's needed to put a screw into something that, that that's not their regime. And so that's where you being able to do this type of work on CAD being able to understand the mechanisms from a mechanical perspective is very helpful. Um, but they don't, people in bioengineering don't necessarily get taught how to do this. And so those who have this skill, who enter into that field are also very uh, highly, highly tied to people. Um, you, you can go from f physics, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, bioengineering, um, aviation, any type of thing that requires construction, architecture, you know what I'm saying? Like if you really want to do architecture, you can go into that area. Uh, but these skills that you're building, especially when you learn to CAD, it's learning how to communicate technology. That's really how you would say that. Like, how do I, how do I come up with an idea and communicate that to somebody else in a way that makes sense that they can also replicate or use? And so that's where that is an applicable skill to a lot of fields it's not going to put you in a position of just being able to be an engineer. It's not going to put you in the position of just saying, I can only be a mechanical engineer, but mechanical engineering is where you see a lot of this work done and um, bioengineering as well. But you, you really can go into any field you would want to, honestly. I guess, are there any other questions from anyone? Okay. Uh, thank you so much. First of all, thank you so much for um, taking time to come see our presentation and also, of course, talk about um, what you do in 3D printing. We really appreciate that um, and your time. So. Oh, thank you. 